ATV's W5. This was an extremely dangerous predator. How can we protect our most innocent from the ones they love? The most selfish, despicable, horrific act any human can do. Did you actually think he was capable of this? A hundred percent. And we're coming for you, ill-begotten gains. The power and the privilege of Russia's wealthy elite. This yacht is valued at over $500 million. Unfortunately, the West is exceptionally responsible for how this wealth got there. A lot of this money is being held in countries like Canada. Here is Avery Haynes. Welcome to W5. It is the most unthinkable crime, a parent murdering their own child. But when it happens, there are often warning signs, signs that have been ignored. Molly Thomas investigates the changes needed to protect children from parents who kill. How did it happen? This is a confession to the RCMP in British Columbia by a mother who has killed her own child. I wanted to protect her and I just wanted her and I both to be gone and be in heaven. Lisa Batstone's shocking words describe what for most would be an incomprehensible act. I wanted to die and I didn't want to abandon her and leave her to him. Batstone had planned to take her own life and did not want her ex-husband Gabe to get their daughter, Tegan. She sadly took a child's life for no reason, right? The most selfish, despicable, horrific act, you know, any human can do. For Gabe Batstone, Tegan's stepmom and two brothers, there's a gaping hole in their lives that a sparkling eight-year-old once filled. She was uh, caring and empathetic. She was a natural caretaker. You can do it too. Right, she just loved to take care of her brothers, me, her stepmom. Tegan spent most of her time with her biological mother, Lisa, in Surrey, BC. Gabe was in Ottawa. The couple had been separated since Tegan was two. Every month, I would be in Vancouver uh, for work, and so I'd spend a weekend every month with her. And she would come to Ottawa at Christmas for a couple of weeks, and we'd spend long times in the summer. But things deteriorated in 2012, when Lisa suffered a breakdown and tried to take her own life. For the next two months, Tegan stayed with her dad and stepmom in Ottawa. But Tegan's mom, Lisa, wanted her back. Gabe tried to convince the court to stop that from happening. For now, maybe we should extend the situation, yeah. given circumstances, right? On one side, you have a safe, stable family home, and on the other, you have someone who's going through challenges and trying to figure it out. Gabe's concerns are highlighted in these court documents. I'm unaware of any steps the claimant has taken to become stable and healthy. He writes. You have a judge, right, who hasn't spent a ton of time. Obviously, they have, they're very busy. And you have a set of untested affidavits, so a bunch of people saying, oh, Lisa's better now and she's good. She's Tegan better. was never asked where she, she wanted to live? Never asked where she wanted to live. No one talked to um, her stepmom, Stephanie. No one talked to her brothers. To some extent, they, they barely talked to me. I mean, it was just uh, one of the worst moments in my life, right, is to take her back to someone who wasn't mentally stable, right, on purpose as ordered by a judge, you know, it's like, how is this happening? Gabe spent the next 16 months worrying about his daughter. He'll never forget the last time he saw his precious girl in BC. When I walked to her class and I remember, you know, it's hard not to cry, but letting go of her hand and uh, just watching her walk into the class. I uh, never saw her again. <sighs> you know, it's hard. I, uh, I'm thankful that her last moments with me um, was, uh, was me taking care of her. Gabe says the courts failed Tegan. The first time where my voice was heard in this process was as I was being examined and cross-examined uh, in the trial for her murder. Right, and that's a bit late in the game. That's the first time. It's the first time I got to speak in a court setting. 
Lisa Batstone was convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Sadly, her daughter Tegan's story is not isolated. 30 to 40 kids are killed by their own parent every year in Canada. On the opposite side of the country, in Bay Roberts, Newfoundland, Andrea Goss is also grieving the loss of a child. And wherever I am, she will be. On the stage, a pretty little girl. This was her daughter, Quinn. If the boys don't like me, they like me when I'm bigger. Only five years old, when she was murdered by her father, Trent Butt. Andrea's ex also tried to kill himself and burn down the house. He survived and is now serving a life sentence. But there were clues he could be dangerous early on in their marriage. As we got more serious, things started to change, like delete certain people off your social media, or I need the password to your email account, or um, I need to look through your phone, and... He wanted to control you. Exactly, yeah. And it wasn't just emotional abuse, it was physical, even after their baby was born. I'd have bruises up and down my arms and my legs, and he'd walk in as normal as anything and just say, make sure you wear a turtleneck today to work or a long sleeve shirt. So that was normal for him to hit you? Yeah. When Quinn was three years old, Andrea fled the marriage. She was the primary caregiver, but Quinn still saw her dad on alternating weeks. Months later, when Andrea was picking up her belongings, she says Trent kicked her down the stairs. After eight years of abuse, Andrea finally found the courage to report it to police. But she says, shockingly, the officer turned her away. He told me that he was closing up the police station and to come back at a later date, a later time. And you, you were telling him that you were just abused? Yes. And to be shut down when I get there was disheartening. Trent Butt was eventually charged with assault, but never convicted. Andrea also says she received a terrifying phone call from her ex while their daughter was with him, threatening to drive little Quinn and himself off a cliff. I reported that to the police. They went down and did a wellness check and said everything was fine. But the point is, a father in his right mind, any parent in their right mind, would never say that, that that would never come in your mind to harm your child. Andrew, we know that he hurt you, but did you think he was capable of hurting your daughter? Yes. I know that the social workers were aware of all the threats, the fears that he was going to harm us. Social workers knew, the judge knew, the police knew. The lawyers knew. The lawyers knew. Yeah. Did you feel like, Andrea, no one was listening? I feel like no one took it seriously. Until it was too late, this precious five-year-old became a pawn in a revenge killing. Trent Butt's suicide letter gives us a rare peek inside a killer's mind. After everything I've had to put up with over the last couple of years, at the hands of a horrible, evil excuse of a woman, Andrea Goss, I have taken my daughter's and my own life, he writes. Andrea was staying with a friend when she got the news. And I remember the lights coming on and her flicking clothes at me saying, the house is on fire. I looked to Victoria and I said, she's dead. She's gone. I knew. Experts say cases like this can be avoided if signs of domestic violence are not ignored. People just don't snap one day and kill their partner or kill their kids. Peter Jaffe is the former director at the Center for Research and Education on Violence Against Women and Children at Western University in London, Ontario. It's a life and death issue that somebody is prepared to abuse their partner and who presents with significant risk factors that partner may kill um, the children. Is it mostly fathers or is it mostly mothers? Child homicides across Canada, 60% fathers, 40% mothers. 
they kill for different reasons. Some kill related to ongoing child abuse, women kill related to mental health disorders, postpartum depression. Men tend to kill as an act of revenge for their partner leaving the relationship. In fact, the judge said it was that desire to extract revenge of his estranged wife that was a motivating factor in Trent Butt's crime. Butt was sentenced to life in prison and is currently appealing his murder conviction. Daddy. Meanwhile, Andrea Goss is trying to rebuild her life. A new partner and a new baby means new beginnings. That hurt so much. She would have been the best big sister in the whole world. She's just never forgotten. Never. Coming up. Domestic violence is real, and you need to know what the heck you're doing. What drives a parent to the ultimate act of violence? He's gone MIA. It's terrifying. When W5 continues. What's your name? Kira. Kira, okay. This was four-year-old Kira. Light up green bean, mm-mm, in my belly, mm-mm. Energetic and always playing make-believe. Ninja never quit. Can I take it? I think about Kira from the minute I wake up until the minute I go to sleep, and, you know, I have, uh, my nights are filled with thoughts of her as well. Kinder damn monkey hugging Joseph. Now. All Jennifer Kagan Beatter has are memories of her sweet girl. She would always run back um, from the elevator, you know, to, uh, to want, you know, one more kiss or one more hug or, you know, something like this. You know, I remember the last photo I took of her with her braids. She loved to have her hair done. That was the last time that, uh, that I ever saw Kira. This was the last place Kira ever went. It was Kira's dad's turn to have her for the weekend. He took her to a conservation area west of Toronto, known for its steep cliffs. It was February, and the forecast called for snow. Kira never came home. Search and rescue crews scoured the area. Later that night, a haunting discovery. Kira's body was found at the bottom of a precipice. Lying close to her was her father, Robin Brown. Jennifer and her current husband, Philip Viadder, are convinced this was a revenge killing. The coroner could not determine a cause of death, but referred the case to the Domestic Violence Death Review Committee. What the coroner did find was there were multiple risk factors for domestic violence. So there, there was a built-in acknowledgement uh, that this is, uh, even in the coroner's perspective, a, a murder-suicide. Did you actually think he was capable of this? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. The couple argues Kira's death was preventable, and they were constantly waving red flags in court about how dangerous her father, Robin Brown, was. This was an extremely dangerous predator who never should have had, you know, one iota of unsupervised time with this, with this little girl. Jennifer says Brown, her ex, became abusive soon after they got married in 2013. It started with controlling her every move. You know, I insist to have the passwords to all of your devices. Mm -hmm. I insist to, you know, know your whereabouts at all times. So a lot, a lot of control. A lot of control, yeah. There were isolated incidences of physical violence that I was subject to where one of the dogs brought in a mouse and I had asked uh, Rob, uh, you know, help, uh, and he rammed it in my mouth, like in a, like, eh, you know, in a fit of, like in a fit of anger. Jennifer says she didn't go to the police because she was afraid Brown would lash out. When I would try to address behavior with him, it was, you know, if you ever leave me, uh, you know, after Kira was born, it was, I'll, I'll take Kira away and you'll never see her again. Convinced their lives were in danger, Jennifer left with her baby. After you left, Jennifer, um, you were in and out of court proceedings, of course, with your ex. How would you describe that process? Utterly, utterly traumatizing. The courts were a forum for Mr. Brown to continue to harass me, to continue to get his claws into me, to continue to maintain power and control over me. 
Multiple judges listened to their case, but Justice Douglas Gray oversaw their custody trial. When Jennifer raised the issue of domestic abuse, the judge said, I am going to ignore it. It is not relevant. He later awarded Brown overnight parenting time, writing, there is no risk to Kira. Jennifer spent more than three years in and out of court trying to prove otherwise. And she says she had mounting and terrifying evidence from her daughter that her dad was going off the rails. She was getting worse and worse. I miss you, mommy. You know, daddy says you don't love me. Daddy says you're never going to see me again. It was a constant, you know, emotional and psychological abuse. Jennifer says Brown's behavior became more erratic. At least twice, he refused to return Kira. She's supposed to come home at a certain time, and we're waiting, we're waiting, and Kira's not there. He's gone MIA. He's not answering his phone. He's not answering his calls. It's terrifying. In January 2020, Jennifer filed an emergency motion asking to suspend or supervise Brown's access. Justice George McPherson found her concerns to be persuasive and compelling, but urged Jewish Family and Child Service to investigate. Two weeks before they were to return to court, Jennifer got a chilling call from the agency's caseworker about Kira's dad. The Jewish Family and Child Service worker um, admitted that Mr. Brown was the type of person to kill or harm his own child to get back at me. And that she was said to you. That was said to me on the Friday, Friday the 7th of February. And she said that uh, she had contacted her supervisor and, you know, she wanted a protection application. And the supervisor had said it could wait until Monday. Jewish Family and Child Service had the power to intervene on Friday if they thought Kira was in danger. They never did. Kira was found dead on Sunday, just two days later. Jennifer and Philip have filed a lawsuit against the organization. The caseworker that interviewed Brown visited their house shortly after Kira's death and shared what she'd told her bosses. The behaviors he was showing are the same behaviors you see in the guys that go out and kill their kids. That's what I said. Okay, I had a gut feeling, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a psychologist, and I can't make a diagnosis. You don't have to be. I, but, All you need to know is something is wrong. Reality. Here's the reality. I have zero evidence. You don't know what's going to set them from here to there until it does. W5 asked the Jewish Family and Child Service for an on-camera interview, but they declined, citing confidentiality. If the system failed such as an extreme and obvious case like ours, then you could only imagine how it's failing other children. Peter Jaffe is an expert in domestic violence against women and children. Why is the family court system so behind? There's still this overarching belief that kids need to have two parents and parents should get along after separation. Everybody should be friends, which is a great idea for 80% of separating couples. But unfortunately, there's you know 10 to 20% of couples who separate where there's some serious issues around child abuse, you know, and domestic violence or intimate partner violence. And those issues need to be thought out quite differently. Jaffe says judges are missing dangerous warning signs in those cases. I still think the majority of judges and lawyers, when they hear the word domestic violence, they're looking for a black eye, a broken limb. They're still thinking physical. We now recognize coercive control in relationships where one person is dominating their partner through a variety of means, financial, physical, sexual, emotional control. It took until 2021 for the Divorce Act to recognize coercive control as a form of domestic violence, but judges have to put that into practice. W5 contacted the body that approves training for federal judges, which says domestic violence is a focus with regular seminars and a mandatory conference for all new judges. But most judges are not new, and for them, that training is optional. Do the judges have the training to be aware enough? I think there needs to be, it needs to be more consistent, more comprehensive, and it probably should be mandatory. I don't think in 2022, any professional, whether you're a judge, a family lawyer, or a social worker, you can't say, well, maybe I'll learn about domestic violence Maybe I'll learn about warning signs for domestic homicide, or I won't. I think it's a matter of life and death. 
W5 asked the Canadian Judicial Council if we could speak with any judge, including retired ones. They ignored that request, so we went looking for answers in the U.S. Domestic violence is real. Kids need to be protected. And you need to know what the heck you're doing. In La Crosse, Wisconsin, Circuit Court Judge Ramona Gonzalez now trains judges in the nuances of domestic violence. Without training on the dynamics of domestic violence, without understanding how that coercive control can work, the decisions can be made contrary to what is in the best interest of children. Right. You can make the wrong decision and it could be potentially dangerous. Correct. I was embarrassed by what I perceived to be some of the mistakes I had made before I went to the training. One of the mistakes that judges make is if you're a loving father and you're a judge, it is very hard for you to believe that a loving father would hurt their child. But you can't let your experience and your values impact what you're listening and hearing. Uh, and we would all love to believe that we, we have the wisdom of Solomon that comes with taking the oath of office and putting on that black robe. But that isn't true. That isn't true. I'm Kira and I'm eating a dried out green bean. Wisdom also means learning from tragedies. That's why, you know, one of the things we're advocating for is domestic violence education and training. Um, you know, I'm not naive to think that this will solve the entire problem, but it is one step. I can't begin to imagine the heartbreak that Jennifer faces every day. February 2022, two years after Kira's death. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Federal MPs tabled a new bill, dubbed Kira's Law, to expand judicial training for intimate partner violence and coercive control. Life goes on for everybody else, but my little girl is dead. And she's forever frozen at four. You know, it's up to us as her, you know, as her living relatives to undo what he did and, and have her be remembered in a positive way. If passed, Kira's law would allow judges to force those accused of domestic violence to wear an electronic monitoring device.